So thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is uh, Stian Hoklev. I'm coming from the Chile Research Group at EPFL. And I uh, have kind of two parts to the presentation. First, I'm going to talk about a tool that we are developing called Frog. And then I will talk about how this could integrate into other systems and uh, new ways of um, integration between different systems. So I come from the collaborative learning sciences. And you know, for the last 20 or more years, people have been looking into the idea that in certain situations, people learn better in groups, not always. And also, they typically don't learn better in groups if you just put them in a group and say, do something. Um, so we have come up with lots of different ways over the years of trying to promote productivity in groups, different designs of interfaces, how do you put the groups together, when do you switch from individual to group or back or to the whole class, and so on. Um, this is a script that was designed by Pierre Delambourg maybe 10 or 15 years ago called Argugraph that was aiming at having a discussion about a topic that was richer than what you would have by just asking them to discuss. And this particular visualization is from a recent book that uh, Pierre wrote called Orchestration Graphs, where he presents this kind of modeling language or notation for scripts, where you have these activities. And when you do activities, you need different kinds of tools, unless you're just talking to your partner. But if you're online and talk to your partner, you might be using a chat, you might be using video chat. So you need tools. You have this idea of social planes. Some things you do as an individual, some things you do in a group, some things you do in the whole class. The groups, how are they formed, right? And thus, so you have these tools that I just mentioned. And you have this idea of uh, information flow. And you don't have to focus so much on the details. The idea here is that, for example, we have groups, they might be random, but they might also be formed based on something you did previously. Uh, we have flow of information. So what you wrote individually could be useful to your group. Or what your group writes might be useful to another group. So we were inspired by this framework. And what we're trying to do is to build this into software. So this is Frog as it looks today. Uh, we have big plans to make it more user-friendly and, and uh, less confusing. So today I'm not coming to you to offer you a finished tool and ask you to take it back to your institution and implement it. Rather, I'm hoping to interest you in an architecture um, of pluggable units and uh, thinking that this has a lot of potential. And I'll suggest some, some ways of collaborating in the end. So let's say that we wanted students to discuss Uber. Okay, it's an interesting social phenomenon also in Switzerland. And we want them not just to say, oh, I read in the newspaper yesterday and, and get stuck on one idea. So we first, we randomly assign them to roles. And we say, you're a mayor, you're a taxi driver, you're a consumer. So you have different perspectives. And first, I'm going to assign you different readings. Right? What, is, what do politicians have to worry about? What do taxi drivers have to worry about? And then I'm going to have you discuss with all the other taxi drivers. And once you've brainstormed all the issues for taxi drivers, you're going to meet with the mayor and the consumer, and you're going to start hashing things out. So some of the building blocks are social operators. You start out with a list of students in your class. In this case, there are many of these social operators, and these are fully pluggable. Um, we assign both a role and a group. So you are a mayor in group one. And then we have the first activity, and we say, in this case, we want them in their roles. So all the mayors together. We have the second activity. And we say, we want you in these mixed groups. Then we have a bunch of product operators. Product operators operate on student-generated data. Or it could be data coming from the outside. Like in this case, where you have an API. You know, maybe it's getting the latest CNN headlines or anything um, that can be gotten through an API. Maybe it's taking something from the whole class and distributing it to different individual students. In here, you see only one activity, but really this might be 20 because each individual student is doing something different. It might be taking individual input from students and aggregating it, right? It might be translating to Spanish, transforming. So the idea, again, is that these are pluggable um, 
and that anyone, so our goal is not just for us to build in a lot of stuff, but to have an ecosystem where people would actually come up with new operators. And part of that idea is one of my personal goals of bridging research and practice. Because being a researcher, I go to conferences on computer-supported collaborative learning where people show off the interfaces that they've designed. You know, they've come up with a new way of doing chat that's threaded so people don't get confused and where you can actually have a chat message point to an object so when you say, this is interesting, people know what you're referring to. And they did lots of experiments and they tested and the students liked it and they learned better. And you say, that's great. I'm teaching a course next week, online, 20 students. I'd like to use that tool. No, you can't. Because research um, is always chasing the next paper. It's always chasing the next grant, which has to usually be a new idea. And so in that case, the tool was shelved. They're now working on something else. They couldn't get more funding for it. And you have the, the academic paper, but that doesn't help me, right? Um, so that's the tools. Then we have this new burgeoning field of learning analytics, big conferences where people are saying, look, I took all this forum data from a course that finished and I applied all these algorithms and I was able to detect which students were actually paying attention and were going to do well in the exam and which students weren't. Or I was able to extract the five different topics that people were talking about. Okay, I have a course right now. I have lots of students discussing in a forum. I would like to know which students are struggling. I would like to know what the five topics are because I don't have time to read 100 messages or 1,000 messages. Right? How can we take this research and put it into production? And the nice thing about Frog is that if you have such an algorithm and if you're able to package it up and if you have standardized data types within Frog between activities, which is necessary anyway to take data from one activity and use it in another, then that algorithm can serve multiple purposes. It can be used for visualizations, right? And these can be live while you're in the classroom you, or in a MOOC. You can know what people are doing. Now, are these particular visualizations useful to teachers? We don't know that, right? I'm not suggesting that the more complex visualizations you give to teachers, the better. But in order for us to begin to explore what are the useful visualizations for teachers, at what point should they be presented? Well, we need a very flexible tool where we can try out lots of visualizations. But we can also use exactly the same algorithm to redistribute student data. So let's say we have 100 people in an auditorium and we ask them, how could the University of Luzerne become more sustainable? Five minutes, everyone's typing on their laptops. We've got 100 short answers, let's say 50 because half of them are not paying attention. We've got 50 short answers. We're in a live classroom. We don't have time to read them, right, at that point. If we have an algorithm that can tell us that some of the answers are about public transit, some of the answers are about energy, turning off the light, using solar, some of them are about working from home, then A, that helps us plan what we tell the students in the next five minutes, but it can also say, you wrote about energy, here's something about food waste. Now, do you want to rethink what you wrote, right? So we can feed in student answers to students live, or we can regroup students. So we can say, here's a student who wrote about food waste, he wrote about solar panels, and he wrote about public transit. Now you guys go together and you've got 20 minutes to write a recommendation to the rector of uh, Unilu. Or we can use it to choose which activities people do. So if there's a quiz testing whether you did your homework, we can then say the people who do well, they get to read an advanced article. People who didn't do well, they go to see some introductory video. Now, again, what I'm trying to lay out here is the possibilities. What exactly is useful, right? Is it helpful for student learning to group them based on who had different opinions? In a MOOC, you might want to group them on based on who are similar, because if there's 2,000 people and four people are really interested in Thomas Aquinas, they would really appreciate finding each other. So the pedagogy comes from the teacher and also from the researcher. But what we're trying to do is to build this tool that's flexible enough to let us explore these possibilities. I showed you some ideas around algorithms and operators. Now, the tools are also important. And I think that we have some quite innovative tools. You all know about 
collaborative editing, Etherpad, Google Docs, you use it often, maybe with your students. Um, however, it is a bit limited in terms of how you orchestrate a class. So in Frog, we have collaborative editing built into the core because all of our activities are both individual and collaborative. So that means that you can put it anywhere you want. You can put it right next to another artifact, like a video. But you can also have collaborative programming where students can immediately run some automated tests and see whether their code is correct. And of course, there's a dashboard for the teacher seeing how many students have gotten which test passed. Right? This is collaborative. So you could do it in a classroom with three people around one laptop, three people with three laptops, fully online. And even such a simple thing like this, this is an image gallery where students can upload images and then we're asking them to comment. Why do you think this image is useful? Now, this field is collaboratively editable. If you try to embed an etherpad there, and I've tried, it doesn't look good and it doesn't work very well. So this flexibility of embedding collaborative editing everywhere we want, I think is very nice, but it also enables some interesting new things because collaborative editing generates huge amounts of data. Every key press is logged. So I know that at 3 p.m. you pressed A and you were in position 580. And I have 10,000 statements like that. But that's not very useful to me. However, it becomes useful if we can go a few levels up in abstraction. So if I know that from 3 o'clock to three, uh, 3 past 3, you wrote this sentence. And while you were writing that sentence, in another paragraph, John was writing this other sentence. And by the way, the sentence you wrote was at the end of a paragraph written by John or written by you. Right? Now we're starting to add this contextual data and we're starting to be able to make inference about what are the different roles that people are taking? Is there someone who's adding new information and someone who's fixing their spelling mistakes? Is there someone who's adding information and another one who's reorganizing, right? Is there someone who's deleting everything that the other person is writing? Um, can we see this over time? So initially you have some behavior and over time you have other behavior. And here's a, 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 an early prototype. You have someone collaboratively editing a document in Frog and you have statistics. Now, in this case, it's just numbers, but going from here to dashboard um, is something we're planning to do very soon. But the important thing here is that what you're seeing is not Peter pressed A and John pressed B, but is, it is, for example, the percentage of uh, paragraphs that's authored by more than one person. Whether the paragraphs are interleaved, so I write something, you write something, I write something, or I write something, you write something. And when we apply this to some data we already have from the University of Ghent, we see that over 30 different pads, students start out just dumping information. So I'm writing everything I know about this topic, you write everything you know, and then they start organizing and moving text around. So this is still very early work, but I think it's very uh, interesting because, again, this is something that we can embed anywhere we want in these activities. Another interesting activity is video chat. Now, again, Skype, Google Hangout, you all use this, you've used it for many, many years. However, in this classroom, if I now ask you, talk to the person next to you about whether this is useful or not, what questions you have for me, and then in three minutes report back, you wouldn't be very surprised, it would work quite well. I could even ask you to move around if I had five minutes. If we were in a Google Hangout or, web, or Switch webinar, and I wanted to do something similar, it would be quite difficult. Now, there are some ex very expensive commercial tools that support some forms of this, but even they are not as flexible as what I'd like. So what we're doing is we're building video chat into Frog just like any other activity. So we didn't have to use any, make any changes to the core. Um, it's just an activity. But what it means is that before, when you said, I would like to put a chat on the side of this activity that they're doing a group, you'd say, now I want to put a video chat. And in this case, we're doing a jigsaw. So we have only, not only one group formation, but we have two. And we want the students to switch between one group to the other group, right? So you have two students looking at a document provided by the teacher and discussing. And then you switch. And you're now in another group formation. You have a collaborative editing tool. And the teacher is asking you to write up some recommendation. So this is an early prototype, but I'm quite excited about it because I think it will enable us to do much richer um, collaborative writing, uh, learning 
in synchronous online settings, both in a 20-person or 50-person distance course, but even in MOOCs. I think there's actually a lot more space for synchronous learning in MOOCs. And I think part of the reason why we haven't seen that is because we haven't really had the tools to do something very interesting. So that was a, a very quick tour um, through Frog and why I think it's a very exciting project. But as many interesting activities that we can build or activity types, we're never going to be able to, and never, nor would we want to, reproduce everything that already exists. Right? We're not going to make a hundred different physics simulations or a complex a mathematical tool um, or, or even a brainstorming tool. There are so many things out there. How can we embed these in Frog? And you say, well, yeah, people have been embedding learning tools in other platforms also for a long time. It's called LTI, it's called SCORM, it's called different things. And I would argue that to truly embed these into Frog in a way that we can really take advantage of the things that I've shown you, we need more than what's currently available. So an example is a concept map tool. Okay, so I want my students to do a concept map, but I actually have a list of concepts already. And they might have come from the students just typing them down, but it could also be an algorithm that extracted them from their forum posts. Okay, it doesn't matter. I have a list of concepts. I want to pre-populate the concept map with the concepts and then have the students link them up. And as far as I know, there is no such tool existing that let me just say, here's a list of tools. Start concept mapping, right? So I want data in. I want to be able to configure the tool. Maybe I say the students have to put a label on all the links, or maybe I say uh, they cannot add any more concepts, right? Different kinds of things. And ideally, I would be able to configure it from within Frog rather than logging into your platform and configuring it there. I need streaming learning analytics, right? I need to know what students are doing right now, not in a week. I need dashboards. I can provide the dashboards if you give me the data. And ideally, I would like this activity to be able to move up to social planes. So if it's a great tool that works for one student, and I say, ah, actually, I want them to do it in groups. Does your tool support that? And finally, I want the data that the student generates. If they create a concept map, give me that concept map in some format that I can work with, a JSON structure, whatever, text, something that I can work with. And I would argue that there is no standard currently that covers these use cases. But what we're trying to explore is what are kind of existing standards or common practices that are beginning to move towards this. And the first thing we looked at was XAPI, because it actually seems like streaming learning analytics is the thing where we're closest. So XAPI is a new standard for interoperable learning analytics statements. So the idea is that you have a statement that's self-contained, that has enough information in itself that you can understand it um, without looking at all the how the activity was configured or what the context was, and that can move between different systems, and that you use linked data so that play, whether it's playing, in a, uh, playing a game or playing a video, are actually two different things, and you are very specific about all of these things. So that seems promising, but how do we actually do this in practice? And the thing that, that provided a lot of inspiration for me was looking at H5P, which some of you are familiar with. It's a new, fairly recent um, set of embeddable interactive content types. So they're not really collaborative. They're not really meant for student creating content. They're more quizzes and interactive videos. But the quizzes are drag and drop quizzes or reorder the words or all kinds of things that we've had for 10 years. But now it's not in Flash. It's very easy to author, and it's very easy to embed. So people are, are interested in it. And the most interesting thing to me is that these activities stream XAPI statements to the browser. And here's a, a very simple prototype. This isn't actually an app. It's just something I built to test this. But what you see is that you have an um, H5P activity here embedded in an iframe. And I'm interacting with some of the interactive stuff. But the moment I go into a quiz, I have XAPI statements in the parent browser live. And as you can see, I mean, even from a distance, it's very detailed, the kind of information that you're getting. And so I think, wow, this is interesting. Because it means that now I can embed H5P activities into Frog very easily. I can let students interact with H5P activities side by side with 
the communication tools that Frog is really good at providing. But I also get this streaming analytics that goes straight into the Frog, the Frog analytics stream, and which can let me do dashboards and these kind of live operators that I was showing you. So that's very promising. And then we looked at maybe one way of encouraging others to share with us would be to begin by sharing Frog activities. Uh, what would that look like? And we were lucky enough to have a great use case, which is Grasp, um, which is an inquiry learning space that's been developed for many years. It's part of um, some several large EU projects. And the interesting thing about this is that they take a very different kind of philosophy than Frog. So Frog is this kind of sequence, linear, you know, people move across these lines. Uh, Grasp is more of an inquiry space where the teacher dis provides students with a number of tools and lets them move freely between them. So it was interesting to see how could Frog tools, and so remember that I'm now, one of the really rich things about Frog, I think, is the idea of graphs where you have multiple tools, operators, and data flow. So now we're taking not all of that, but one specific thing, which is the individual activities, and we're seeing can we make those available. So what we already have as a functioning prototype is that the teacher in Grasp can say, I want to add a frog app. They can see a list of different apps. In this case, they might choose to add a video. And so they have a config uh, window, which is actually provided by frog, but it's styled and it looks exactly like it's part of this application. So they configure it. And now the students that log in can see this video. So that's great, although you might say, Yes, it's not very difficult to embed a YouTube video. Um, the difference is that now the teacher has a live dashboard showing the different students how far they are in the video, whether they've paused, whether they're still playing, and so on. So that's kind of interesting. Again, I'm not coming to you with this fully baked tool. I am suggesting an architecture of pluggable activities. All of the activity types I showed you are separate NPM repositories with clearly defined APIs. Uh, it should be quite easy to build new ones. We had a um, class of uh, master students actually all having to build frog graphs and design new activity types, uh, including one that I really liked was Morse code chat, because um, they were teaching Morse code, and so they had social, they had students both tapping with sound and with the uh, visual. So it is an ecosystem. We're working with a few different labs already. The invitation to you is if you think this is interesting, are you interested in thinking about how you could integrate your tools with Frog or how Frog could integrate in your platform? Are you interested in trying Frog in a classroom in your university? Or if you're a HAPE or HEP, do you have student teachers who would like to try this in their school classrooms? Um, it's open source, uh, the, the link is there. Um, and there's also a bunch of documentation there. So um, thank you very much.